Hi everyone and welcome to this new LifeBoard video that aims to go through the anatomy of the female breast. Specifically, the learning outcomes associated with this LifeBoard video are to be able to describe the normal structures of the female breast, including the developmental, anatomical and physiological processes from in utero to menopause. In addition, we will also cover some clinical applications with respect to carcinomas and common cysts, and more so we'll talk about some of the key hormones that are critical in the development of the breast. So starting off in utero, we know that the breasts are going to develop from the milk line, and the milk line in an embryo um, and then a, a fetus is going to run from the mid axilla all the way down to the groin. So the breast is going to then develop from this milk line and it's usually going to be the last remnant of the milk line in that pectoral region to then persist in the fetus. So what I've drawn is the ectoderm and we know that the ectoderm is going to condensate or, or come together at a point roughly at about eight weeks in utero and this is then termed our mammary bud. So this mammary bud is then going to grow towards the breast fat pad. So this is then going to grow as a, as a cord like structure posteriorly and this occurs at roughly 16 weeks in the fetus. And ultimately then, at around 20 weeks in utero, we start seeing the formation of the ductal system. This can usually be between 10 to 15 ducts, and essentially this lays down the foundation then of the electrophorous ducts and then what's going to be the lobules later on in life. We know that there's going to be a series of developmental processes that then occur within that fetal period. For example, we know that the nipple is going to be inverted really up until the, the full term stage of the fetus and at which point it's then going to become everted. We also know that at roughly that 32 weeks in utero, we see the, the development or the coloration of the areola, which is going to be the area of skin just adjacent to or surrounding the nipple. If we then consider what is going to happen really when we reach full term or at birth, although it's a, a rudimentary ductal system, so meaning that it's not really going to have a function, it's not going to be very advanced in terms of its development, it has the capacity actually to produce some milk. And this milk might be termed witch's milk. So it means that at birth, within the first couple of days, an newborn baby has the ability to actually produce milk. And this is just due to the influence then of the mother or the parent's hormones. If we then cover where exactly the nipple is located with respect to our surface anatomy, let's cover some important landmarks. The surface anatomy of the nipple is going to correspond to the fourth intercostal space as we can see on the diagram above. This is an important demarcation in both males and females and is roughly going to stay at the same point up until the lactating or postmenopausal female. What we can also see with consideration of our surface anatomy is we know that the posterior wall or the base of the breast is going to sit upon that thoracic wall, just superficial to the ribs. There is going to be muscle that overlies this as well, which we'll cover in a second. But then thinking about the general position, if we were looking at someone's breast from an anterior view, the breast is also going to be located from the mid sternum or lateral to the sternum and then extending to the mid axillary line. With respect to a sagittal view then, we can see that the breast in an adult female is going to extend all the way from the second to the sixth ribs. Let's then think about what is the actual arrangement then of the base of the breast. So we know that just superficial to our ribs, we have important muscles that are going to be our pectoral muscles that is going to provide the muscle interface for the breast tissue to attach to. So specifically, we have our pectoralis minor and then anterior to that, our big pectoralis major muscles.
We know that muscle is always going to attach to bone via a fascial layer. So what I've drawn in yellow specifically is going to be the superficial fascia, so that connective tissue lining or outline that is going to surround the muscles. So we can see that we have a superficial fascial layer that is going to surround both pectoralis minor and major. And then we can also see we have a space here which is going to be formed by the deep fascial layers. And this space specifically is going to be of clinical significance as it represents the retromammary space. So this is going to be a potential space and is quite important when we're considering mastectomies or if we're looking at cosmetic reconstruction. In order to be a little bit more representative, I've had to redraw our diagram because remember that ductal system that is going to be rudimentary in the newborn is actually going to move anteriorly. And what we can see in the course of puberty is eventually it's going to align with the nipple. And this is important because we know that each of these lines that I've drawn is going to represent a lactiferous duct. So the lactiferous ducts actually come together at the level of the nipple and they are going to then dilate into lactiferous sinuses and then they're going to eventually exit the nipple via nipple pores. Although what I've currently drawn is not quite representative of um, the typical breast in that puberty period, I thought we'd just kind of draw the shape of the adult breast, but we'd just talk about what happens to the ductal system in that developmental phase during puberty. During puberty, we know that in females, there is going to be a huge surge in estrogen. So, the function of estrogen on this ductal system is going to be the expansion of the ducts posteriorly into the fat pad. So the big role that estrogen has on the ductal system during puberty is we start seeing the growth of these lactiferous ducts posteriorly into that fat pad. We also know that the role of estrogen is going to be to increase adipose tissue or the fat deposits. So consequently, we're going to see an increase in the size of the breasts during puberty. In males, on the other hand, during puberty, there isn't going to be that production of estrogen, which means then that the ducts are actually going to atrophy and then retreat or involute. Clinically, however, in males, we may see breast development at this particular life stage, and that could then be associated with gynecomastia, for instance, or alternatively, we need to think about the role of medications. So for example, antibiotic steroids, when they break down, may then release estrogen, and estrogen could then result in that temporary development of breasts in males. Moving then into post-puberty, so in adulthood, with each menstrual cycle, we know that there's going to be estrogen and progesterone that are going to be produced or that are going to be our main hormones at play. With each cycle, we're then going to see the proliferation and degeneration then of branches associated with our ductal system. So the fact that estrogen is going to be produced means that we see even further growth of our lactiferous ducts backwards or posteriorly into that fat pad. And then the role of progesterone specifically is going to be the development of branches or alternatively what we call extra lobular ductal units that are going to further dilate the ductal system or the glandular system. During adulthood, we also see an increase in melanocytes that are going to be in that region of the areola. So the areola, in other words, is going to get darker. If we then consider what is going to happen during pregnancy, there are numerous changes that have to occur in the ductal system to prepare for lactation. Specifically during pregnancy, we know that there's going to be an increase in estrogen and progesterone once again. And as soon as the placenta is developed, there is going to be a massive surge in the amount of estrogen and progesterone that are produced. 
As a result, the main consequence of this is we see extensive filling then of the breast by the glandular tissue. And what this means is our lactiferous ducts are going to grow further posteriorly to reach that posterior layer of adipose tissue. And we're going to see a lot more extensive branching with respect to our secondary and tertiary branches. In addition, due to this mass increase of progesterone, we actually see alveolar development as well. So the actual alveolar themselves are going to proliferate and what we see is going to be a change of the epithelium within the ductal system and our lobules, which we'll get to in a second. That is going to change into lactocytes, which is going to be important for the production of milk. Obviously at this point, milk is not going to be produced yet. That is only going to come after the baby has been born, so in that lactation phase. But it's important to then prepare the epithelial cells for the ability to produce milk. On this note, it's important to remember from your physiology that progesterone is going to be responsible for inhibiting prolactin. So prolactin is the hormone that is going to trigger and be responsible for the production of milk. So at this point, because there's such big amounts of progesterone that are being produced, no milk is able to actually then be created because prolactin is still going to be inhibited. I probably haven't used the right color scheme in the slideboard video, but I'm going to draw on the alveolar buds that are going to then develop during pregnancy on our diagram in blue. Let's just take a moment and zoom into what is going to be the terminal lobular units that we can see corresponding to these alveolar buds. Let's then consider what this looks like in a normal female that is not pregnant. What I've drawn on here is going to be from our lactiferous duct, we can see that our primary side branches are then going to be those extra lobular terminal units. And these are then going to, if we are to zoom in a little bit further, we can see in non-pregnant individuals, we have our extra lobular duct coming down, and then we have a lobule that is going to be the final termination of that particular structure. The lobule then, on the other hand, is going to be made up of about 40 to 100 individual alveoli. So we're just looking at a cross section then through the actual lobule and we can see all of our epithelial cells lining the outside. If we then think about what happens during pregnancy, we then have changes in the actual epithelium that is going to allow the proliferation of our extra lobular terminal units to then give rise to secondary and tertiary branches that are then going to be the intralobular terminal units. And then we have individual lobules associated with each of these. So the actual tree is then going to dilate, get bigger and more complicated. So just recapping some important terminology, we have our lactiferous ducts that are then going to give rise to collateral branches that are going to be those extra lobular terminal units. During pregnancy, the role of progesterone is going to be to increase the branching pattern. So we then see the differentiation into intra lobular terminal units and then each of these have lobules associated with them and those lobules will contain our alveoli. So this specific cluster from extra lobular terminal unit downwards is going to then encompass a lobe. So the lobe is then associated or interchanged with the mammary glands. Each of these lobes or glands are then draining into the lactiferous duct, from the lactiferous duct into the sinus, and then expelled outwards. We've already spoken about the fact that we have this retromammary space, 
and this space is then going to be lined either side by our deep fascial layers. We also know that within the breast, just deep to the skin itself, we also have a superficial fascial layer that is then going to extend all the way posteriorly. What is important though, is we need to actually have shape to the breast. So size is going to be determined by the amount of adipose tissue that's then correlated to that release of estrogen. But in order to then have shape of the breast, we need the role of suspensory ligaments. So separating each of our mammary glands, we have a series of fibrous connective tissue structures that are going to then be our suspensory ligaments or our ligaments of Cooper. These ligaments are then going to attach directly to that deep fascia on the anterior thoracic wall. And they're also then going to attach to the superficial fascia on the superior breast. So obviously, given the amount of adipose tissue and glandular tissue, the breast can get quite heavy. So we need to then suspend them superiorly to the, the roof of the breast, essentially. So these ligaments are going to be spiderweb in arrangement and attach directly from the fascia to the ducts and then to that posterior wall. I won't draw them all on, but you get the gist from this diagram. Let's now move into what happens during lactation. So the female has now given birth and we see a big drop in progesterone and estrogen hormones. In addition, we know that the alveoli themselves are going to be milk containing. So if we're thinking about some of our physiological processes that are going to occur, the fact that we have that reduction in estrogen and progesterone, we're now going to trigger a physiological cascade to the hypothalamus that is then going to activate the pituitary gland. The posterior pituitary will produce oxytocin, whereas the anterior pituitary gland will then signal the production of eventually prolactin. If we then consider what does the actual gland then look like during pregnancy, we essentially see a filling then of the glandular space and most of the breast is then going to comprise of glandular tissue because there's ultimately going to be an increase in the alveolar size. The lobes as a whole are going to increase or get really, really big because there's going to then be milk that is produced and stored within those alveoli. Prolactin is then going to cause the production of milk from those lactocytes. And then we need to squeeze milk out into the ducts. The mechanism in which this occurs is going to be due to a specialized arrangement of cells that are going to be myoepithelial cells that almost create a spider web around the individual alveoli. So these myoepithelial cells are controlled by the hormone oxytocin. So oxytocin is going to be released. It is going to cause the contraction of these myoepithelial cells. Remember, myo means muscle. And the contraction is then going to push the milk out of those lobules, lobes, and then back into the lactiferous ducts. From the ducts, they would then pass through the lactiferous sinuses and out through the nipple via nipple pores. Let's just come back to that nipple areola complex. The nipple itself, as we mentioned, is going to be central or medial to the areola, which is the circular, darker or more pigmented structure as depicted in orange. And the areola is going to contain melanocytes, giving it its dark pigmentation. In the areola, we'll also notice a series of tubercles that are referred to as Montgomery's tubercles. And this is going to be the exit point for the Montgomery glands. So the Montgomery glands are going to be sebaceous glands that are going to release fluid that's going to be responsible for lubricating and protecting the nipple from cracking. And it's also going to be responsible for helping the baby to latch. So we know that there's going to be a certain odor associated with this fluid and it is going to attract the baby to the nipple. 
These Montgomery glands have been drawn in pink and they're also going to be sitting just posterior to a smooth muscle structure at the nipple that's going to help with squeezing or pushing that milk out when the baby suckles. As I've mentioned before, the areola is going to also increase in its pigmentation, so the density and amount of melanocytes during pregnancy. And this is important because it actually provides a target for the suckling baby to latch onto. This also brings me to the point that there are mechanoreceptors located within the areola. So when the baby suckles on the mother's or the parent's nipple, this is then going to then signal cascade up to the hypothalamus, then to the pituitary gland, then to release prolactin and oxytocin. This will cause the formation of milk, oxytocin will cause the contraction of our myoepithelial cells, and then milk will be squeezed out. The smooth muscle will then also assist with the squeezing to then enter the baby's mouth. During menopause, on the other hand, we know that there's going to be massive changes associated with hormone levels. And as a result, the ductal system and lobular system is going to atrophy and regress back to that pubertal state. So given then that the breast has undergone so many changes with respect to its size and as a result the adipose composition and deposits, at menopause we tend to then see a decrease in adipose tissue and we also see that the suspensory ligaments or the Cooper's ligaments are going to become stretched. I've just labelled on our diagram the different life stages that we have discussed in females. Obviously keep in mind this is not a representation of the entire breast and what I've tried to do is give you a bit of an indication of longitudinally how the mammary glands and ductal system will develop from puberty all the way then back through to menopause. If we then turn our attention to why normal breast anatomy is quite important when we're thinking about clinical considerations or presentations, it's important to remember that the mammary glands are going to be modified sweat glands. Because they are sweat glands, they actually lack a fibrous capsule around the glands. And what this means is if we have abnormal growth or proliferation of the epithelial tissue, such as might be the case in cancer or if we have an invading mass, this can then infiltrate the surrounding breast parenchyma. And this can then have implications or invade blood supply or the lymphatic drainage. A couple of things we might want to consider is if we're thinking about carcinoma and specifically talking about ductal carcinoma in situ or lobular carcinoma in situ, this is referring then to carcinoma or cancer that is going to be confined to the ductal and lobular units. Specifically, we see that this is actually going to be confined or in situ to those terminal ductal units, which is going to include the alveoli, the lobules, and then those intra and extra lobular terminal ducts. This is then also going to correspond to those early stages of cancer classification. On the other hand, if you hear the term invasive ductal carcinoma, this is referring then to the carcinoma actually invading the surrounding breast tissue. So if we're going back to our arrangement of our epithelial cells that we know is going to line the individual alveoli and the ducts, if we then have proliferation or breakdown then of these cells that are then going to cause a cancer to invade the surrounding glandular tissue, including the suspensory ligament, this is then going to correspond to invasive ductal carcinoma. So it's actually invading the surrounding space. And what we might see is actual pulling then or shortening of those ligaments. From a presentation standpoint, this might then result in dimpling of the breast tissue, we might also see if it is going to be large enough or um, widespread enough, we can actually then also see inversion of the nipple. If there is invasion to the blood supply, we might see bleeding of the nipple. And if the lymphatic system is going to be implicated, we might see an orange 
peel appearance of the areola and there might be subsequent inflammation and swelling of the breast itself. And then finally, if we consider cysts, the most common of which is going to be fibroadenomas, which is the most common type of benign cyst found in individuals between 20 and 40 years, a fibroadenoma will typically, and in simplistic terms, originate from a blockage in those terminal alveoli that is then consequently going to dilate that interlobular duct. Given its composition, this is typically then going to present as a highly mobile, non-tender, palpable lump. Accordingly, you can see that given the normal structure of the breast, it is important that you have an awareness of the lymphatic drainage, which we have discussed in another Lightboard video that was co-created by students from the University of Adelaide. So I hope that you found this Lightboard video informative as we've stepped through some of the major hormonal and mammary gland changes that we see throughout the female lifespan. Thank you very much for bearing with me as we played around with different color schemes and as we try to draw out what is considered to be quite a complex topic in a very simple manner.